We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison, the United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we're very honored and lucky to have with us Danny LeBlanc, longtime community organizer. Danny has been the executive director for 20 years of the Somerville Community Development Corporation and is still at it. And uh, Danny, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you come from? and uh, where you got your values from and your yeah. interest in organizing? Well, you know, uh, I'm a lifelong Massachusetts kid. Uh, grew up in New Bedford, um, really working class family, you know, so uh, Catholic, working class Catholic family, I guess you'd say. The, the two portraits in the living room were John F. Kennedy and uh, Pope John the 23rd, yep. give you an idea. Um, I'm the oldest of seven kids, so pretty much working class and I, I, I guess I would say my values were probably fueled by my parents in a lot of ways, mm. although like a, like all kids, we were probably all teenagers in general, you fought a lot with your parents, especially <laughs> with, your, with your father, you know, length of hair was a huge battleground. You might remember Michael in those days. Yeah, yeah. That's but, um, right. you know, but, but they worked their butts off to support, you know, seven kids and a family and, and we had a, you know, I, I would say for, you know, uh, a dad who quit school at 16, you know, didn't finish high school and so forth, he made a decent living in part because he had a union job, worked worked hard, had, had a job that was unionized, so that, that really helped a lot. And I would say the other thing, uh, if I go back to that era, was the, the prevalence of all of the social movements of the 60s, the mm -hmm. late 60s, but especially the Vietnam War. I happen to be... I turned 18 in 1972, which was the last year that you had to register for the draft or decide not to, mm -hmm. but there was no draft in 73 because they, the, the uh, decision was made on the federal level. So I'd say those things began to shape you know, my values as a kid, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went to UMass Amherst and there was just a lot of eye-opening there, a lot of opportunity, I'd say. Like what, what was um, eye-opening? You know, it's funny when I look back uh, on it, and sometimes I say this a little bit snidely, but um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of ex SDS, you know, Students for a Democratic Society uh, kids and anti-war movement kids, when it was clear the war was ending, they didn't actually really want to go work yet so they went to grad school <laughs> instead oh, really? so there was a lot of kind of political leadership in a, in a, in a variety of ways uh, at UMass Amherst when I was there that's where I went to school mm -hmm. um, and you know I just kind of gravitated in that direction a lot of it a lot of the injustices in the world <laughs> began to make sense to me in relationship to you know what I saw and what I knew growing up there you know there were there were some tumultuous times in New Bedford not not on the, a scale as 
uh, as great as you know places like Watts and stuff like that. But there were racial tensions. Uh, there, there was some racial rioting. There was a curfew one summer when I was a kid. That kind of stuff. Mm. And so as I studied and learned from other peers, some of that stuff began to make sense to me. Mm. But how did that? How did you gravitate that way instead of like trying to make more money or? <laughs> You know, yeah, uh, you know, because some uh, people saw the war in Vietnam and they say, "Hey, the hell with that! I'm gonna yeah. get a college degree and I'm gonna." Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, listen, I'm I'm not opposed to making money. <laughs> no, no, join the club <laughs> um, at all. But you know, I I think um, honestly, through school, through college, I kind of thought I was going to be a high school teacher, mm. and I thought, you know, I had this sensibility that I wanted to do something. Mm good in the world. I did want to make a living. Yeah. I thought teaching kids, teaching high school kids in particular. Yeah. Um, you know, but I had also gotten active in a number of things politically. I, it, oh, yeah. Ironically, when you look back on it, one of the things that was happening in the mid-70s was that the first iteration of the um, Governor Dukakis administration, what we used to call Dukakis I, oh, in right. the 70s, Wonderful man, I think he's a very good governor, but he's also a technocrat and he saw budget gaps and one of his responses was to cut funding for public higher education, which of course if you were a public university student at that time, you would be opposed to. So I got involved in uh, or mm -hmm. early organizing against budget cuts for state higher ed. Basically. Was this when you were still this at This is UMass? when I was at UMass, yeah, 1974, oh. 75, 76, those, oh. those years. Um, and that might be among the things that caused Mike Dukakis to not to lose the next election in 78. Mm. And then, of course, he won again in 82 right. and, and served for eight more years. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of um, uh, early sentiment uh, in opposition to nuclear power, which was just emerging mm -hmm. at that time. So I got involved in in some early stages of that with uh, what used to be called the Clamshell Alliance right, and so forth sure. in the 70s. Um, and, and then I got into organizing as a profession entirely by accident. Oh, yeah. uh, How I, did that I, happen? I, you know, was, I, I was out of school. Mm -hmm. um, I was silk screening t-shirts in the south end of Boston, just a job, trying to figure out what I was going to do in life. I thought maybe I might try to become a jazz pianist because I, I, that's a sidebar oh, yeah. of mine. That's great. Right. And um, a friend of mine from college came over one day, I was home, I think I was sick, so I stayed home from work. And uh, he said, you know, I just interviewed for this thing and it, it's not really something that I want to do, but you might be interested. And it turned out to be a VISTA funded community organizing job with the, uh, an organization called Somerville United Neighborhoods. Oh yeah. That yeah. was uh, then uh, being led on a staff level by Lou Finfer, who's a guy that you and right, I both sure. know well mm -hmm. uh, for many years. Um, and I ended up interviewing, getting hired, and that that's the path. The, oh, the, really? That yeah. became the path. I, I stopped thinking about trying to go to Berkeley to learn jazz better. Really? And yeah. I um, kind of eventually gave up the idea of being a high school teacher and so forth. Oh. So, and you were how old then, about? 23, oh, 22. Wow. So this was yeah, 20, 23, right one year out of, of college, yeah. So what was that like working at Somerville United Nations? You know, uh, I used to say, and I still say sometimes, you know, there's, I, I'm not going to quote this right, but there's right. like everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Yeah. I would say everything I need to know as an organizer I learned in those two years at Somerville United really? Neighborhoods. What, what All the that? building blocks that you and I have both learned, you know, how to reach out to people, how to, how to respect that you're working for them and not for what you're trying really? to do as an organizer. Um, how to put a meeting together, um, various tactics and strategies. And, and it, it, Somerville, you know, I, I realize when I talk to people today, people, people appreciate the hyper-gentrified Somerville. Somerville was as gritty working class as they get in those days. It was this a very, was what year about then? I moved there at the end of 1976. So this was the beginning oh, right. of 78. So they, we're talking late 70s, Somerville was a very, very different place than it is today. Right. And um, and I and I just loved the work at that point. You know, yeah. I, I learned I learned a lot of values. Uh, you know, I quit the Clamshell Alliance, for example, at that point because mm -hmm. I came to realize that they didn't respect working class people in the way mm -hmm. I thought they needed to be. And Somerville United Neighborhoods was about organizing blue collar and poor people, which is something that I kind of realized was in my sweet spot. 
Yeah, you know, and, something that and I really what was that doing. like? What were you actually doing? What was going on then? <laughs> you know, in those days, I, this was seventy six. Count, the, ta count the, the times that I uh, uh, have told the story. So That's literally, okay. the, my first day on the job was the first of the two days of the blizzard of nineteen seventy eight. Oh wow! And I actually was. I had to go to this training session in Providence, Rhode Island, that turned into a four day stay in Rhode Island because I couldn't <laughs> get out right. basically. But the very next Monday, Lou said, here's your territory, go start knocking on doors. Um, so I went to Davis Square, Somerville, right, right in the middle of Davis Square. This was before the T was there. This was before, the T was in construction actually. It was right. the very oh. beginning of the construction. There was a lot, of, one of the issues that I would hear when I went there was um, there was a lot of uh, impact on people's homes from um, uh, tunnel blasting because right. Porter Square, as you know, is very, very low and Davis right. Square is somewhat depressed as well. People's foundations were getting cracked and wow. stuff like that from really? the dynamiting wow. going on. But honestly, <clears throat> I knock on doors, <laughs> Lou said, don't come back for four hours, go knock on doors. And so I did. And the issue I kept hearing over and over again, and you think about this, I'm a 23 year old kid. Yeah. So there's this dynamic where um, there's a store 24, now it's a Tedeschi's, I think, um, or it might be a 7-Eleven, but it's, this, it's a convenience store. And at that time, it was open 24 hours a day. Mm. And I'm knocking right in that immediate neighborhood and door after door, what people are telling me, that parking lot is a nuisance. At two o'clock in the morning, every drunken town is in that parking lot right. because store 24 is open, we gotta do something about it. Mm. I'm a 23 year old kid, I, I, I kinda wanna change the world. Sure. Do I care about a, kid, a nuisance? But part of the learning was, well, it doesn't matter what I care about. It matters what they care about. Right, right? exactly. So, right. so eventually, you know, fast forward five or six months, and we got a city ordinance passed that restricted hours. You, in Somerville, and I think still to this day, you have to have a permit if you're a convenience store to be open past. It's either 11 or 12 yeah. at night, and that store did not get a permit. Right, um, so what was that like? What did you do to... You know, um, I knocked on all these doors, took people's names and numbers. Nobody had cell phones in those no. days, of course. Uh, we didn't have computers. We, you know, no. we, we didn't have copy machines, actually. Right. But, you know, um, eventually I realized that was the issue. So I approached a um, couple of people who seemed like they had uh, the willingness and the ambition to be, mm -hmm. you know, leaders of this little neighborhood. One of the women agreed to host the meeting. Um, we had a planning session in somebody's house of 10 people. And, um, wow, that's pretty good. You, you know, an interesting lesson that I learned, and this, I, I credit this to Lou, he said, okay, when, when you're working with the person who's gonna run the meeting, when it comes time to plan the public meeting, which is what we were doing, we we're gonna invite the owner of the Store 24, when Betty was her name, when she asks people if they'll bring other people, Ask them to name three people they'll bring. Right. Now, and write and it they down. Did. They did. <laughs> and I would swear to this day that not a single one of those people that were named came. Hmm. But every one of those people felt like they had made a commitment and they had named three names, so mm -hmm. they better find somebody. So when we had the public meeting, we had 60 people. You know, that's great. Like small numbers, very small no, building block. People but, and right, right. And that's, you know, that's kind of how you start and how you get people, especially in a poor and working class community where people have long at that time felt like they really couldn't get anything done. They didn't have any clout um, mm -hmm. to get it done. And in this case, they did. Um, you know, they didn't, they didn't persuade the store owner right. uh, to close, but they were able to get the Board of Aldermen to pass the city ordinance. So how did the they do that? How did they get the Board of Aldermen to... Yeah, well, we did a little bit of research and found out that a couple of other communities had attacked that same problem that way, this idea of a 24-hour place maybe being a nuisance yeah. center. Um, I think Newton was one of the communities that had already done that. So we kind of had a, a, a blueprint. We had a, we had a template that we could use. We got the, we sort of got the favor and the interest of the then Ward Alderman, who interestingly was also my age at that time is a very young alderman, 23, a recent a Somerville wow. native who had just graduated Tufts. And he and I actually joked, we'd say, geez, we might have been one of those drunks out there at two in the morning, <laughs> you know? You think about these things, it's, yeah. but, but if you're raising a family and you're living right next door to yeah. this, it's, you don't want that no. interruption. But he was very sympathetic, trying to do his job as an alderman, so he championed it. 
Um, we had to run a little interference. There was then a little chain of convenience stores called Sunnyhurst that was very politically connected, well connected. Mm. We kind of had to persuade that owner that we weren't going to go after him because he probably would have been mm. he probably had that owner probably had enough clout to kill us at the board of aldermen at that time. So, a lot of so lessons, all these little lessons that you right. learn that you can you can then take to a bigger stage if you're trying to fight for rent control or for some statewide mm -hmm. legislation some of these same things are lessons you would use sure. tactically and strategically just on a right. bigger stage, basically. And how did you, I mean, something I think about a lot is how people think, you know, the old saying, you can't fight City Hall, mm. you know, it's, oh, no one's going to listen to us, particularly yeah. working class folks that are used to being told what to do. Yeah. How did you get them to go beyond that, go beyond what might be their... You know, yeah. oh, I can't do this, who am I? You know, I mean, I think part of it is, um, and, and you and I, I think both know this as organizers, you have to be careful about the battles that you pick because you, mm -hmm. you need to be able to win some things because if you, if you pick a battle that realistically is too big for people to win, then, mm -hmm. then it reinforces what you just right. said, oh, you can't fight City Hall. This felt like something that we could do something about. It was small enough, local enough. Uh, people clearly felt passionate about it. You it had the important. young alderman. We had the on young your alderman. Side. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you know, if we had picked, you know, at that time politically in Somerville, Somerville had rent control, and right. it was about to be voted out at right. that point by, by the board of aldermen. If I had gone knocking on doors and people had said, "We want to fight to keep rent control." Well, we did fight that battle eventually, and we lost it, actually, right. in Somerville. Um, and the same organization that I worked for fought that battle. If that was the first experience that people had, they'd probably burn out. Yeah. Um, so. But even so, with uh, their own feelings of maybe not being, what, what did you do to get them just even to move beyond what they, Yeah. something I've been thinking about. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, um, I think just, um, my showing up at their door was a novelty, first right. of all, at that time, right? right? So no one's ever stood in Yeah, who, nobody <laughs> ever came and asked me what I thought person, before. Right? Right. <laughs> yeah. You're the first person. Yeah, to and, and then there really right. was a lot of passion and, you know, legitimate anger about, sure. you know. I mean, one, I remember this one, this one guy was funny. He was, he was a classic Italian of that generation, and I'd show up at his house. His name was Frank Antonelli, and he'd say, Mama, go get Danny a cup of tea. Danny's here. I didn't ask for a cup of tea, but that's that was that's his what way. What the of being. Italians do, I but know, right? He had three kids, you know, and and right. they were school age kids at that time. And the idea that his kids would get woken up in the middle of the night and stuff. So I think a combination of the novelty of my being there yeah. and my willingness to help them, you know, having a meeting in one of their homes right in that immediate neighborhood so it was very <coughs> kind of comfortable so it was Betty's a neighbor house, inviting right. a neighbor you know that kind of thing um and and then um they were willing to give it a shot and you know we kind of we kind of had a fun meeting with the owner in some ways even though um he didn't agree we we made him feel very uncomfortable it was an interesting thing Another one of those little lessons, Lou said, get a room that's a little too small, <laughs> right? Because right? you want a packed room. Well, not only did we get a room in the congregational church up the street in the day from Davis Square that uh, was, we had to pack people in, mm -hmm. but the only entrance into that room was opposite where we set up the front table, so this owner couldn't get out <laughs> except going through the crowd. So you could kind of see him sweat a little bit. Right. And anyway, so people, felt good like we had at least made him feel heat even though right. we didn't win at that point and then we had another alternative strategy through the board of aldermen so people at least you know and all of this transpired in about four five six months maybe so yeah. people felt like there was movement and progress and ultimately enough. we did win that right so. now you've been organizing for decades and decades since that time what are some of the lessons you would actually draw out uh, to people kind of, whether they're starting out or in the middle, what, what are the most important things you think people really need to pay attention to to organize folks? Um, 
You know, I, I already said this earlier, but in some ways, I, and I might argue this is the most important thing, it's not what you think, it's what they think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's your job, is, right. is to figure out where people's, you know, we all have opinions in the world. I, I, sure. I think organizers should also not pretend they're blank slates, you right. know. That's important. Yeah. yeah. Say yeah. more about that. Well, I, I, think, um, I think if you want people to be honest with you about what they feel, what they're passionate about, what's important to them in the world, mm -hmm. you have to be willing to share a little bit of that yourself, yep. right? Um, because otherwise they feel like you're maybe a sociologist asking yeah. them some questions. And Which stuff. you're not. Yeah, you're trying to develop a relationship. And one of trust, you know, think about this. I, I, I you know, and I'm talking about this time in Davis Square. I, I had a kind of a scraggly beard. My hair was pretty long at that time, and I'm 23 years old. I'm showing up at their door asking them what they want to work on in the world, you know, <laughs> what changes or improvements they want to make. You have to establish some credibility somehow. So I think mm -hmm. that... That sharing and that honesty is is part of it. I think um, deliver on what you say you're going to deliver, and don't promise something you can't deliver. Mm -hmm. As an organizer, you know, mm -hmm. don't don't tell them you can do something you can't. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. You know, picking the right battles and being honest about those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I think is is also you know, being able to say to people, well. I understand you're concerned about this really huge problem, climate change, you know, let's right. just say to pick a big one. Um, but we're not gonna be able to solve that right now. How about if we focus on this? Maybe it's a piece of climate change that's very local that has a mm -hmm. handle on that. And learning some of that kind of technique and strategy, I think I would, mm -hmm. I would um, advise people, I think, yeah. young people getting in. Yeah, what, what else do you think is real important for people to do to remember, you know. Um, pay attention to the things that matter to people in their personal lives, even if oh. though, you know, remember somebody's dog's name. Yep. <laughs> Some of this stuff, when you think about it, it's what a good politician does too, yeah. right? And there are similarities. The difference is you're trying to work with people to coalesce as a group to yeah. get something done. A politician is trying to get elected. But some of that relationship building, you know, remembering something about their kids, what's, it, it might not be the issue you're working on, but it's something important to them in their lives. So you, you want to pick up on those cues. Yeah, um, why is that important? I mean, I agree with you. Why? Yeah, I, I mean, I think because, again, um, what we say about this kind of, some of us grew to say about this kind of work, at least, is that it, it, we call it relational organizing. Yeah. You know that term, Michael. Sure. And, it, and it, it is built about building relationships of trust first between <laughs> you as an organizer and people and among themselves. Mm -hmm. Because people have to have some trust if they're going to take some action together. Because there's going to be bumps along the road, yeah. you know, and you, you want to be honest about that. You know, some, some um, people that you go to for to solve certain problems are not going to take kindly to your going to them. They might get no. ticked off. They might throw you out of their office. They might yell at you. <laughs> You've um, been there. <laughs> yeah, right, all these kinds of things. And, and what can hold people together through some of that is that they've already built up some trust among themselves. They built up a sense that they have a common cause together. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that takes work and takes careful relationship building over yeah. time. What kind of, I think that's so important about building trust both between you, the organizer, and them, and you said among themselves. How do you do that? Um, I, I mean, I, I think uh, some of the things that that I, that I said before, I think you you need to you need to be honest with them. You need to be forthcoming with them and not not hold back. Um, you need to deliver when when you you know. So if I meet you at the door and I say to you, okay, I'm going to be talking to other people in this neighborhood. Can I get back to you? Well, if I don't get back to you, then I've kind of broken the first thing that I've said. You know, so mm -hmm. get back to them and report to that person, uh, the, mm -hmm. the man or woman that you spoke with and you said, after I talked to some of your neighbors, can I get back to you? So little, so I think it's a combination of being vulnerable enough yourself and, and, and you know, being, you know, expressing some of your passions in the world if so you're asking other So what do you tell them about yourself when they say like, why are you doing this, Danny? Who, you know, you know? So it depends on the person and depends yeah. on the circumstance, but I might talk about my parents and what I learned from them as, a, as kind of a working class kid in, in, in New Bedford. Mm -hmm. um, 
Depending on the issue, I, you know, I have a godson who's, who was born with Down syndrome, so I'm, and, and I, uh, well, now deceased brother-in-law who was, uh, lived with cerebral palsy all his life. Depending on who I'm talking to, I might share some of my, uh -huh. um, just my cares in the world, having two close people with disabilities in my life, yeah. and what that has meant to me, and what that's meant about my own sense of justice and fairness in the world and stuff. You know, I get, yeah, what I do get you actually ticked say? off about curb cuts, you know, for example, yeah. because my brother-in-law in the wheelchair, he actually fell off a curb because there was okay. no curb cut, broke both his legs. Wow. Um, you know, that kind of thing. I, I might share that. Uh -huh. Depends on what the person has shared with me sometimes, yeah. you know. But that's real, that's a very important yeah. lesson. Yeah. I might share something about housing. If I'm asking people about housing experiences, I've done a lot of that. Share something of my own experience with housing. And so like what, what, what would you share? Well, you? you know, <laughs> um, when Paul, my wife, Paula and I first got together, she was a single mother with two kids and in a one year span, she had to move four times. Uh, twice because she was uh, ev uh, evicted and once because she moved back with her parents and then back out of her parents again only to get evicted again wow. painful stuff you got two yeah. kids that are like you know they were six and eight at that time you know the right. two kids and stuff so so i might share that if if we're talking to people who are expressing concerns about you know uh high rents people getting evicted that right. sort of stuff so it's affected you too you're not some right I'm, sociologist right from I'm the not university. some highbrow from you know that that's doing this as an academic study I have some of my own life experiences that that you know kind of motivate me as well that I can yeah. share with people and that might be in common with them yeah, yeah. And any final thing you want to convey to people <sighs> who may be uh, you could tell them like one thing not to forget or always remember yeah um, I I would say two other things if I got enough time to say that. One, one is I, I would say, and this, this is an old saying that came out of the Industrial Areas Foundation organizing mm -hmm. after a while, um, no permanent allies, no permanent enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, there, somebody you may be doing battle with might be your ally the next time around. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhat related to that, I, you know, I had a, we talked about my early Somerville times, but I spent 20 years as the director of the Somerville Community Corporation, right, right, right. a community development corporation, so it uh, didn't only do organizing. But um, for 18 of those years, Joe Curtitoni was the mayor. Um, Joe Curtitoni was a very longstanding mayor. And we had a very complicated relationship. And, and to be open to having complexities in the relationship as you go forward. This is all in the public world, all this stuff, right. you know, that you do. Um, to be open to having some complexity in the relationships and some give and take and to know when to negotiate and when to compromise and when not to and that kind of stuff, I guess, is what I would say. Well, thanks, Danny. No, that's great. <laughs> no, I really appreciate your taking the time to sure. come out here. Good to see you again. Danny LeBlanc, yeah. longtime organizer, former executive director of the Somerville Community Development Corporation. Now he's still doing the work. Again, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown, your host for We Hold These Truths. And uh, I just appreciate Danny coming in here and uh, being able to share some of his life's lessons. So thanks a lot and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you and signing off. <laughs>